Hej och välkomna till ännu en kväll med Stockholms arkitektförening här på Konstakademin. Uh, so we are very happy to have you here today, Robin. Uh, and yes, the stage is yours. Oh, thank you. <laughs> um, thank you very much for the invitation to be here. It's an absolute pleasure to be in Stockholm. I have to say for the first time, although I'm a world traveler, in fact, but um, it's thrilling to be here and an honor to be in your lecture series. And I'm just going to, I won't tell too many um, small, silly stories, but I'm just going to be, begin with one because I feel a bit connected to Sweden. Um, in fact, I am American, but I've been in Europe for many, many years. And um, I grew up in a region in the United States where many Swedish settlers came to to the United States. So when I had my first job on the east coast of the United States at the end of the job, everyone wrote um, on t-shirts for each other, wrote some messages. And on my t-shirt, every message ended in a question. And I said, why is that? And they said, because you end every sentence like going up, like it's a question. <laughs> And I realized that I had a Swedish-American dialect. And so <laughs> I've always felt quite connected to Sweden for that reason. So it's um, thrilling to be here. And um, with that, I will jump in. The title of this lecture, In Search of Geographical Reenchantment, is a title I developed in the last years uh, through the work I've done through my projects which I will explain what the title means and, and then go into the projects. And the projects that I'll show are um, largely from my own office, but also from my time uh, in the office I co-founded in Zurich Studio Volcan, which I left last year. And so you'll see quite a mix of, of um, kind of projects. The problem that I have been facing, and I, I, most of my projects are on the urban periphery, as I guess many of our projects are today, and there's an incredible uh, move towards sterile, generic, standardized landscapes, both city, periphery, and landscapes uh, outside of the city as well. And this um, was concerning me more and more that, um, that landscapes don't have a voice, including urban landscapes, and that many, many lobbies have a say in how our landscapes look. There's the ecologists, the recreational people, there's investors, farmers, um, traffic planners, et cetera, et cetera, planners. But there's one that doesn't have a voice, and that's the landscape itself. It uh, increasingly doesn't have a voice of its own and doesn't have the ability to move us. This is a photo from the <coughs> excuse me, well-known German photographer Thomas Struth, and he did a series of photos on the edge of Zurich um, years ago. And this is one of them, and I think it speaks for itself. That's what we tend to call landscape. Switzerland itself, where I've done most of my practice, is a land of the, as we call it, agglomeration or urban periphery. It's a tiny country, and they have to build on all the square meters that aren't too steep. And so it has this sort of um, spread, uh, enormous spread. And these are the places where most of my projects happen. And so I came to a point where I decided that um, I needed to find a way that site-specific landscapes would have the ability to go under our skin to, to move us. While I was a student of landscape architecture, I ran into this quote from Le Corbusier, the purpose of architecture is to move us, and I thought, well, that must be the purpose of landscape architecture as well, or one of them. Uh, and again, reading this, I, I follow the atmospheric troupe. I guess you all know at least Johanny Palasma, if not uh, some, many of the others. And in this fairly recent book about atmosphere, the editor made a plea for us planners to put more atmosphere in our projects. And the photo that accompanied it was a 1920s photo in sepia color, mind you, of historic Paris. Paris. And, and I thought, gee, thanks for the tip, but my sites don't look like that. <laughs> they look like that. So um, what are we going to do? I mean, how can I get out of this bind? How can I move forward? Uh, I became increasingly fascinated by the urban periphery where I was working and by the frictions, the contradictions, and the paradoxes, for example, between infrastructure and the voice of nature coming out of every square meter it can by itself. And I began to consider how can these sites um, have a poten poetic potential? How can they become something exciting? Or this site, which is um, 
artificially planted wetlands and meadows and woodlands in front of the parking garage of the Zurich Airport. Uh, Zurich Airport. <coughs> Excuse me. So while I was working on many of the projects that I'll show this evening, I ran into a book by this um, geographer um, in England named Alistair Bonnet. I'm, and I became fascinated by an expression that he uses in passing called geographical reenchantment. And this hit a note in me, I would say, that I thought maybe this is a way out of this box. And I'm going to quote from his book, unruly places have the power to disrupt our expectations of stimulating and reshaping our geographical imagination to re-enchant geography. Aristotle said place should take precedence of all other things. It orders the world. Space sounds modern in a way that place doesn't. The reaction of modern societies has been to straighten and rationalize the oddity of place. <coughs> Excuse me. I was eating nuts for the last half an hour. <coughs> I'm okay. <coughs> this is a painting by the German painter Gerhard Richter, which has to do with this experience of imaginative space. He uses them in his paintings, the sky as an imaginative space. And I'm going to look at just two very short quotes with you that talk about the dialogue between our inner worlds and our outer worlds. And this is the clue to imagination and to atmosphere, is what it resonates inside of us. Uh, the, for scientists like Humboldt, who was trying to understand nature, the dualism between the external and internal worlds, was the most important question. Humans were like citizens of two worlds, occupying both. And from Jorge Luis Borges, the taste of the apple lies not in the fruit itself, but rather with the contact of the fruit with the palate. In a similar way, the meaning of poetry lies in the meeting of the poem and the reader. So both of those uh, start to imply this dialogue between the inner and outer worlds, which I've become very interested in. And so uh, some of you might know there's, a, there's some theories about uh, landscape as um, nature, the first nature being the natural nature, this underlying layer of uh, the underlying carpet of of nature, the second nature, which is referred to as the cultural uh, landscape, how we build political, uh, social production. <coughs> and I decided that as the third nature is not gardens, which is the traditional reading from John Dixon Hunt, but that I would add a layer called the imagination. And it's the personal sphere, the intellectual, the emotional, and it's informed by memory, experience, and longing. So. This is actually me speaking. I've decided to try to understand. Some people said, what do you mean by that title? In Search of Geographic Reenchantment is not about nostalgia, prettiness, or being emotional. It is the search using projects as concrete testing grounds to suss out the poetic potential of a site with the ability to fascinate, engage, defy expectations. It aspires to create memorable and specific places which serve as catalysts of our imagination. I'll begin with the first project. It's the Museum of Natural History in St. Gallen. The original site it was a cow pasture, a very small cow pasture, and in the middle of the periphery of the city. In fact, it's sitting on top of a highway and surrounded by multifamily housing, sports fields, um, traffic arteries, etc. On the right, you see the Museum of Natural History, a new building, and on the left, a cathedral. And this site, um, there was no program for the site, but what I found the biggest challenge was how do you get people to immerse themselves in the power of uh, natural history on a site that's surrounded by all this cacophony of stuff, and how, how can I make an experience that's very powerful? So I actually used two different measures. Oh, I can point here. Uh, one is surrounding the site in green so that you're you're actually isolated from this cacophony of, of things. And the second are stepping stones, the way we know in gardens, because when we look at our feet and we have to walk gingerly, we come into our bodies, into an embodied experience. So with these two measures, I worked towards creating a place that one could get lost in, in fact. These are, most of the photos are taken just after planting, so they, there's not too much green, but you'll see some, some diverse photos. So this is actually, uh, oops, what am I doing here? the path for, for handicap, 
But these stepping stones I enlarged to up to seven meters in size, and they became the carriers of information that are strewn fragments about natural history, and that because they're strewn and fragmented messaging, they become catalysts for our imagination. They also become not only circulation, but a kind of a toy or a game for children to jump around in. So the second thing I did was cover the entire site with a beautiful green uh, sandstone that's uh, limestone that's uh, from that region so that the entire site was access is accessible. Uh, you can walk anywhere you want. And this is what uh, the French philosopher Melon-Ponty refers to as participative perception. You choose your route, you choose where you want to go, and therefore you activate your own inner sense of moving through space. So the entire site is accessible. You can walk on the, on the concrete pavers. And then I began to play with understanding of culture and nature. So I used the same stone. I had this relic from the stone quarry where I got the stone. And I placed different relics around. So you're confronted both with the natural stone and then the stone which is used for all the important historical buildings, old museums, chapels, and so on and so forth. And the stone paver, the concrete pavers themselves became a messaging as well of the discussion of culture and nature. I. Um, built them, so to speak, myself with a, with a company. And on the one side, when you hammer it, it looks identical to uh, Nagelflu, it's called, which is a composite stone, the most important stone of the region. But you can also, in fact, Nagelflu and concrete are the same. Concrete is the man-made version of the organic Nagelflu. But then I used wood slats and drain mats and other things at the same time, so the messaging becomes very um, Two, twofold, I guess we say in English, or my English has rather gone to pot. So the, the concrete itself and its formulation becomes uh, a carrier of, of storytelling and of knowledge. I met with a specialist from the museum and studied fossils. It used to be a tropical ocean there, which no one can imagine in today in Switzerland, of course. And so there are all these very special fossils which I then um, cast into the concrete pavers. Dinosaur heads. These are, were all on uh, there on site. Dinosaur heads. They were all there. Um, I also put large thirty centimeter um, words, <laughs> uh, quotes, and and words from the story from um, the geological and geographical history of the region. This one is from Darwin. Nothing in life is constant except change itself. So the the garden or the park becomes a storytelling of all kinds of information. I had to plant woodlands from fresh on the, on the cow pasture. This is, you just see the first years, this is the two, year, two seasons of growth, just coming up, um, the ferns and the, and the trees and so on. And in order to make uh, his natural history accessible, I grew up in Chicago, there's a fabulous museum of natural history. And I remember always reading there was two million trillion years ago, or was it 20 billion trillion years ago? And I could never remember these dates. So I thought, OK, I'm going to take the three most important geological eras and um, ex ex what would we call it? I, I really don't speak English anymore. Um, show them in the landscape. And I, I'll try not to go into too many stories, because each of these photos has um, very many stories. But these are basically the erratics that roll down from the glacier melt. And I have such nice stories about all of these things, but I won't. Here's the woods just starting to come up and become a bit like a woodland. And I uh, uh, especially on purpose took the hydrangea and put it in because it's a non-native. It's from south of the Alps. And the local ecologists freaked out. They tore the project through the press as being the most in human, non-natural, disgusting, I don't know, because there were hydrangeas. And I had to take the hydrangeas because it's on a, on a highway tunnel, and I wasn't allowed to put anything that had deep roots. I wasn't allowed to put, so and it was a big drama. This took like two years. Uh, we couldn't continue the project. So I, I used these a bit as a trick. But it was also an expression of the artificiality of this natural site, because these uh, ecologists had hoped that I would make a semi a natural looking place. And I said, this is urban maintained nature. So I'll just finish this project with a few more images of the site. And the scenography of history, these are cypress trees, because it used to be an ocean, and they actually grew on that site, and the old tree trunks, and so on. This next, next project is the airport part of Zurich, uh, Air, airport park of Zurich. It's just opened. I did it together with Studio Volcan uh, as the main designer. And it's, I call it, natural preservation meets shopping mall. The site is this small circle of 
nature. And when they built the highway in the 70s, they cut this glacier moraine off from the mother glacier moraine. So it became this island. And in the course of time, it became highly, uh, had high ecological value because no one could get to it except a few neighbors who would run across the highway risking their lives to walk their, oh, sorry, to walk their dogs there. So this was the site of the park. It was an international competition. And you can see that in the meantime, from Riken Yamamoto from Tokyo, he won a competition for this huge building. And the airport is to our left and cut this off even more. And that was the site of the competition. Here's the circle building, which is just open but under corona, so no one's in it until now. And also the airport has been basically closed. The result is that when you're on this glacier moraine hill, almost everywhere you look, you see this building. So you're in a natural space, but you're looking out at this very peripheral situation. The woods are very young. They're 40 years old. They're scraggly, sort of thin little things. There's a few larger trees on it. And that's all, one reason is you can't um, put trees very high at an airport. And it's maintained by foresters who have the job to maintain it, but no one will ever use the wood for anything. So the place is full of paradoxes and contradictions. And this image I showed before, these are artificially planted natural features. And you see the airport parking. The history of the site is a very funny sort of wedding cake of natural and artificial, the old glacier moraine, then the airport um, making this beautiful curve around the glacier moraine when it was first built, then the construction of the highway, and the excavation from the highway was plopped on top of the glacier moraine, making these very strange sort of earth sculptures. And then to compensate for the lost land, they planted it with artificial wetlands, meadows, and forests, and put it under natural preservation. So you have this very odd mix. These are uh, historic Swiss paintings on the left and the third picture. And these are photos from the site. And they look almost identical. So on the one side, you have this very bucolic site. But most of the time, it looks like this. And you can't get much more banal than this, except for the other projects I'm going to show you. We all know these problems. <laughs> um, so how do you make a really interesting project for very intense use, something like thousands and thousands of visitors per day, but with incredibly strict and many ecological laws? So you can't hardly do anything there. So we took the ecological plan as the point of departure for the design and said, OK, we rearrange it, but we will, won't change very much. Um, and basically, I used two different measures to make the park first into the storytelling. The first is create a circle. This is called the circle, and the moraine is a hill. And so I used this 200-meter tree ring to mark that as an iconic gesture seen above from the airplanes, marking the, the moraine and um, referring also to the building and the topography. And what you see here is the, well, I'll go into the site in a minute. I have to see if I put in another plan. No, sorry, I will tell it right here. Here's the tree ring. This is the woodland that's left, the scraggly woodland. The sky platform, which I'll show you, woodland pavilion. There's a series of woodland interventions, Wildwood Plaza 2 and Fire Ring 2. I'll show you. I uh, used my own structures. Uh, um, and two loops, the sky loop, which carries you up, and the woodland loop, which carries you around. And the second storytelling is for the four layers, because I was very absolutely fascinated by this glacier moraine, this archaic Swiss glacier moraine, then the Swiss woodland, and uh, also Swiss local phenomena, then this very strange topographical sculpture with this weird excavation thrown on top of the glacier moraine, which became quite sculptural, and then the sky, which I thought I considered to be a landscape because we're at an airport. So I actually don't want the sky to be a void. I want the sky to be a place, a physical place we can feel. And these are the competition, um, some of the visualizations we did moving up through the glacier moraine into the woods. And we worked together with Niels Busse, um, Anders Busse Nielsen, who you probably know from the uh, Woodland Laboratory here in Sweden and from Denmark, uh, working on the strategy to open up the woods and fighting with the foresters to, to lighten up the woods in order for it to unfold. The woodland layer. Uh, here's the pavilion, which I'll show you in a moment. Um, the pavilion, the woodland pavilion, interacts with the site. So it actually walks up the hill. And it, the roof is fragmented so that 
it frames the sky, it frames the woods, and it frames this glacier moraine. And I did this on purpose because on one side, I wanted to create a social setting where they could be big events from the hotels and conference centers. So you could have a performer here um, and an audience here. You could have parties here. You could have yoga classes. People can sit on the stairs. So there's an entire series of social programming that go with the pavilion. And this is the sky platform. And at the time of the competition, I couldn't decide if I should use fog or a reflecting plane and which would better capture the sky. And I'll show you what it did. So here's the park built in winter. A photo of the peculiar topography, which I really set out to present, um, presented visually. The tree ring, freshly planted, 12 meter trees. A path through the new open woods. We opened up some of the woods, which was, took about two years of negotiations with the ecologists to make a new category because, um, yeah, won't go into that, all those stories as well. Some of the sketches planning the paths. We couldn't have one meter more path than were there on the existing site, so I was planning where to put them. Uh, okay, and here you can see the, the site plan with these different features. And this is an amphitheater looking down at a stage, and, and I explained the rest, I think. You can see here, sorry, in this, the maintenance lines that foresters use to maintain woods, I found that fascinating. So I accompanied them with a row of, of trees so that they would become this strange linear experience, which is about maintenance of natural spaces. Here, a sketch of mine from the pavilion showing how you could have many, many people, one person or 100 people, and you would always feel at home in that space. It was very important to me. Here's um, the first images of the pavilion. You see how the roof is um, fragmented to, to capture many views. It's embedded into the little woodland grove. And I'll talk about these chairs in a moment. And here are people starting to use it to sit at its edge. The chairs are movable. Um, and this site, this is not a very attractive photo, but what you see here, it's actually a film I took. I went during lockdown when teenagers had nowhere to go to meet. And they came up here, everything was dead, airport shut down, everything. And they were up here every day with their boom boxes doing dance contests. And it was so moving to see all these young people coming out and just participating in this place, and it gave them really a place to be. This is what I call the fire ring. I'll show you the original in a moment. It's a kind of a cowboy fire ring where classrooms and strangers, employees of the airport, of the circle, all these different people can come and grill, which is a kind of a national sport there. And so it's using the means of the woodland itself to create a social event within the woods. Here's some sketches for the yoga mats, which I'll show you on the cusp of the top topographical break on this site. And I put them there so that people could read or take naps on their lunch breaks. They can kiss, they can <laughs> do yoga. Um, it's a kind of beds. They're sort of woodland, woodland beds that gather in the woods. Here are the chairs looking out to the beautiful surroundings of the periphery. Uh, some seating, which um, I placed them, but I, I, or I, I proposed them, but uh, some uh, furniture designers actually designed these very nice concrete things. And the other chairs, um, this is the Adirondack chair. It's from 1904 in the United States. And they put it in the old landscape uh, hotels so that you'd sort of stare out at the landscape as a, as a, a task, was, is enjoying the landscape. So I said, let's do a contemporary version of that. And we got these furniture designers to build this contemporary version, which weigh a lot so they can't be stolen. And you can carry them all over the park. And now we're up at the sky platform. We've just moved up through the vertical layers. Um, what you're looking at here, the water platform is 17 meters in diameter and the sky platform 30 meters in diameter. And this is when it reflects the sky, so it brings the sky down into a physical space. And at the same time, it does produce fog. And, uh, okay, I won't, sorry, I could tell so many stories, but I won't. Uh, here's the fog coming up. And this is a photo taken on my iPhone. What happens is you actually get lost in the fog. And getting lost in urban conditions today isn't that easy. So the moment where you get lost is just so beautiful. And then, of course, the whole place, the fog and the water, take on the characteristic of the sky. So you have these sometimes very, very strange um, foggy days. Or you can have these very special moments of sunset. And this expresses sort of the whole park. I was up there one day just seeing how it's going, which they're, they're still, just the people are just beginning to come. 
And this is an African ambassador who lives in New York and works for the UN. And her daughter married a Swiss guy living in the neighborhood. So you're at the airport park. And this woman's flying in on her way to New York internationally and meeting her family, which is local. And they're all meeting at this park. So it becomes a kind of an interface for these different worlds. The next project is the original Wildwood Plaza. It's a project from my former office before, Studio Volcan. Um, I was asked by this small city near Zurich to do something, uh, well, I was asked to do some things in the landscape. And I took a look at the entire landscape and did the sort of geological reading because they have very special landscapes. Here's the drumlins from the glacier pushing in towards the city. The city's right here in the middle. Then you have a lot of woodlands to this side of the city. And here you have a lake on this here. So I said, OK, you have three special landscapes, drumlin, woodland, and lake. Uh, where should I begin? And they said, do something in the woods. And I, well, what do you mean something? Well, just anything, anything to make the woods experienceable. Could you please, then they asked if I could start with this little fragment, which is also a hill. So I looked at the hill, and I ended up making three clearings in this little woodman fragment. And as you see, we're right on the periphery. So you're basically staring into the bathroom windows of the houses and trying to be my wish to make an immersive experience in the woods. And what happened is that on this little hill, there's three completely contrasting woodlands, woodland characters and imagery because of the storms. So when the big low tower and the big storms swept over this hill, on the protected side of the hill, the huge stately beech trees stayed. But on the hardest hit side of the hill, everything was raised. All the vegetation of the woods was raised. So you have pioneer vegetation, very low and dense, like a jungle. And on another side, you have this strange apocalyptic scene where the plants are thrown all over by the storms. And so I decided that the per sole purpose of this would be to sit and watch the woods grow and just to sit in these spaces, which I'll show you. There's a beautiful um, book from the British writer John Fowles called The Tree. And he says, nowhere but in the woods are the two great contemporary modes of reproducing reality, the word and the camera, more at a loss. The woods defeat, defeat viewfinder, drawing paper, canvas. They cannot be framed. The words, and words are too futile, hopelessly too laborious and, and used to capture reality. So he's basically saying that the woods have their own kind of magic. And I wanted that people just get lost in this sense of the woods that you can't capture. And I decided to take a paving out of the same material that woods are made of, meaning using the tree trunks to create paving. So that rather than seeing a woods and then seeing paving and seeing seeding, you would just melt into this entire experience. This is the one clearing with the stately beech trees. The second with the pioneer vegetation. And the third with these uh, thrown around vegetation struggling to survive on the third hill. The third clearing, excuse me, which moves up a hill. And now they're beginning to weather and have patina. So that project won a prize for the city where it was built. And they came back to me and said, could you make us something else? <laughs> I said, what do you mean this time? And they said, hey, something else to get a prize. So last year, I, I built the fire ring. Um, I went down to the lake uh, this time and um, studied the site. There it is with a view of the Alps in the background. And the site that I chose is actually a field where people lie in their bathing suits and jump in the lake to go swimming. And it's also, as you see on the right, a place where people grill. And grilling is really a national sport in Switzerland, very, very important. And the only way people really grill is in their private cliques. So you have one table there with this group, and then one table there with this group, and that group. But no one, it's private sphere is very important. No one really talks to each other. So I'm an American. I came and I said, I'm going to make a cowboy ring grill. And everyone who walks by can just come and sit down there. And you'd have all these strangers who would start to become kind of neighbors or start to form a sense of community. So this is 10 meters in diameter and made of these tree logs. And on the one side, you have the recreational space. And on the other side, a natural, semi-natural landscape. And what I did is I used the theme to create an entire series of social settings of all different kinds. So for example, you can have people, some sitting here, chatting with friends here, or working on their laptop there, or meeting here, or um, 
lying down or all kind of different uh, constellations. You can make huge parties. There are all different kinds of ways to, to use the site. And the idea would be that it's like a bonfire, that people are, in the summer you can make huge bonfires and people are drawn like moths to this fire. And I tried to express the materiality of wood by keeping some of the irregularities in the project. Uh, this means super beautiful in German. I was, uh, went to a place to choose the trees and the forestry guys had just done a very quick shoddy job of cutting the wood. And it had this beautiful texture, and I said, no, it really expresses the wood. I really want to use that. So I took that to be the surface. And the result is you have this beautiful, soft, temperature-neutral surface, which people then, all the kids lie around in their bikinis and you know, hang out on this wood because it's so strong and beautiful and soft and, and neutral in temperature. But then I tried at the same time to express stone as a material. So I took the stone around the fire ring and actually it keeps the heat. So on this cool summer night, it was getting cold in the air, but you can go down there in your bathing suit and lie on the stone, and it's like, it's a warm carpet. So I'm trying to make this place speak and, and use the materials, and here it is at night. This next project, um, also a competition um, that we were able to win, and I used something I'd been working on since my master's thesis on water and light, which is something that interests me quite a lot. This was an um, art and architecture competition on the edge of Zurich, on the entry to the city, for a sound barrier wall. And um, it's about a kilometer long and 50 centimeters wide, a very funny site. And we could choose between steel and glass to fill the concrete frames that the um, National Highway Authorities had given, had given as a, they had to use their own, their own frame. So there's a new law in Switzerland which requires sound barrier walls everywhere where a residential area meets a, a traffic artery, a loud traffic artery. So these things are springing up all over the place. And the city of Zurich said, we don't want just any old wall there. We want something that actually is a bit nice. So they made this two-phase art and architecture competition. This is the site, also typical, also generic, also pretty banal. And how on earth can you make something poetic or moving out of such a space? So I was thinking about my many years of working with glass, and I thought maybe if we etch the glass, it could become interesting in terms of the imagery that attaches itself to etched glass. So um, I went and got a whole bunch of glass, and we etched it in six different gradients. Um, and, and the result is that you have something between reality and then blurring reality. There's a nice word in German, verfremden. It abstracts and, and blurs the reality. So instead of a sunset, you get this huge redness, or the autumn leaves become orange. That's the, uh, the sun. Um, that's a hill, actually, the traffic lights and so on. A quote from John Cage which I found very uh, appropriate. There is no such thing as an empty space or an empty time. There is always something to see, something to hear. In fact, try as we may to make a silence, we cannot. And this silence almost anywhere in the world today is traffic. If you listen to Beethoven, it's always the same. But if you listen to traffic, it's always different. So <laughs> I thought it would be um, wonderful to show this ever-changing flow of human life in the city, the traffic coming, the traffic, uh, what are the heavy traffic times, the sunlight coming, everything coming and going, and using this glass to portray the happenings of the city. The wall's about four and a half meters high. And here's a study, uh, I was looking at the context of the site, and just the few photos again, a hill, autumn colors, an office building, office lights, traffic lights, sunset. So you have a juxtaposition, in fact, of natural and artificial light on the glass, becoming night, vegetation, and traffic lights together. So basically, I call this project the Poetics of Infrastructure. How do we take the normal tasks we have, which are global? Most of these projects you're looking at are global. We all have airports. We all have traffic arteries. We all have these places and using them to capture that what's beautiful around us and portraying that like a, a live painting on the wall. This next project is um, a very different kind of poetic. It's the poetic of power, war, and military. It was also a two-phase international competition that we were able to win. I did it also with Studio Volcan as the design 
head. And it's under construction just now. It's the Campbell Barracks on the edge of Heidelberg. This is the main entrance with this historically protected Nazi building. You see the sculptures there, the soldiers standing at the entrances, the clock tower. And after the Nazis left, the US military took it over together with NATO headquarters of Europe. So it has this very dense historical background. And the competition was for all the outdoor spaces. They call it the other park, um, not a very special name. But the point is you have all the fragments of military open spaces, parade grounds, riding, uh, riding grounds for the horses, um, Nazi military elite park, etc. And to do something with all of these fragments of open space and make it into a new park, because for the first time in its history, uh, the normal citizens of Heidelberg can use the park. This is a view across the parade grounds, which is 120 meters in diameter, absolute emptiness, looking back towards this uh, historic building and the flagpoles of the Americans. It's quite an odd site. I'll give you a few impressions of the site. This is as we found out with this gore, as we found it in the competition, with this gorgeous vegetation overgrown. Most of it, unfortunately, has been maintained now. The um, communication tower, uh, the barracks. And so what fascinated me about the site is, um, I, I think we were 27 teams. And I was the only one that used the history as the basis of the design. The other 27, they were German, Belgian, Spanish, uh, of different countries. But they, I think everyone's a bit at a loss what to do with such a site. Some made playgrounds or painted it pink or with stripes or, you know, what do you do with such a site? And it just happens that I'm American, so I felt connected. And it just happens that I'm Jewish, although I have nothing to do with Germany. So I felt somehow very... I felt this history was a very profound and important thing to communicate. But I didn't want to do it in this heavy way, like a memorial. So I said, OK, I'll flip the meaning of all these elements of power and control to become elements of um, encounter, social encounter. And I'll do it in a way that makes, even for young people, makes this history accessible. So this actually means um, park of encounters there. Yeah. And what I did was I took an entire series of elements and I made this, in German, it's a nice word, umdeutung. I changed the meaning of them. So I'll just flip through a few and then I'll show you some sites of the build, some pictures of the building site. This is the grid that they used, uh, um, <laughs> let's say the innocent grid of the farm fields that de then became the grid of the military base of controlling the site. And that's sort of the innocent version, then the Nazis took over and my attempt to give it back to the people. So the streets become the place of social encounter. The oak tree, an archaic symbol of, of uh, strength, Nazis took it over as a symbol. I give it back to the German people. It's the main species of the site. The eagle, an archaic symbol of strength, Nazis took it over, made it their symbol. And it's on the site. You see, you'll see them as large stone eagles. Uh, and I'll show you the sound installation I'm working on to give it back to the people, and so on and so forth. This is the oak tree, the only witness to the entire history. It was there from before the Nazi period. Here's the stone eagles at the main entrance with the um, surveillance cameras. Surrounded by surveillance cameras, of course. The site was. Furniture from the 50s and 60s from the Americans. Cult, uh, oh no, sorry, that's German, cult verdächtig. Um, lamps from the 1970s, like just, there are all these artifacts there. We got a little brochure at the beginning called, um, it was just stuff that was on site, and the city's like, I don't know, you know, you want to use it, anyone wants to use it, here's a book. And no one used it, but I was fascinated by these strange objects all coming together. So here you have an aerial photo of the entire uh, site of the competition. And uh, here's a couple of schemes so you can imagine. This is uh, taking over the streets and making them spaces of encounter. Then, whoops, I think I just skipped one. Oh. Then analyzing all the potential users of the site and where they could use um, what kind of spaces. And then here are the main spaces of the site, main open spaces connected by this, what we call this, uh, the red band. And the red bands. Ben makes this whole thing a coherent site. That's a park, the marching grounds, the um, riding plaza, the vitrina, which I'll explain in a moment, and, and those kind of sites. And the other thing I did, which I found really important, was I renamed all the sites. So that the marching plaza, 
which used to just be the giant uh, square of, I called the forum, and the forum in that intense, uh, that incense of the Greeks, of everyone coming together, freedom for open communication. The, oop, the riding plaza for the horses, these were the stalls, which is a show of power of military, became the cultural market. Um, this Torhaus Platz became the vitrine, meaning a showcase to show what's behind in the site because you don't see the site because of the buildings from the main artery, the main street here. And this park became the People's Park. It used to be where the Nazi elite, the NS elite, could um, dine and walk through a park. So here's some collages from the competition. Um, keeping the void, it's still 90 meters in diameter, but um, making it a place for people to meet and filling the edges in a place where you can have picnics is the only time I'm going to take the time to tell stories. You know, uh, you all know if you all have offices. Um, while I was teaching in the United States, a technician of the city decided these would be a great place to put retention. So they're now sunk 40 centimeters. They were supposed to be the place where all the people looked at the forum and instead they just got sunk. So, I mean, all kind of things happen, but anyway, this is more or less the thing. This is the cultural market where many festivities and cultural activities come together in, um, in one of the historical buildings. Um, there's a group in there that has concerts and all kinds of activities. This is the historic uh, park for the NS elite, and I decided just to put little interventions um, in it to leave it the way it was, so you really feel the history, but there are these paved uh, things which we called living rooms for the people to appropriate for themselves. Uh, this is, I took it last week, it's under construction. This is the big main plaza and uh, a fountain, which is the shape of a satellite, and then some seating elements um, for the people to fill up the edges. The fountain, which will humorously have some water jets. It's 12 meters in diameter, I believe. Then we also ground up the historic pavings. You can see these kind of disgusting red concrete pavers that we all hate from the 70s. And we ground them all up. Uh, also old, I mean, you have every possible paving in there from the Nazi period, from all the different periods. And we ground them all up and poured them anew into concrete. These were the tests. Um, I actually chose this one in the end because I thought the stone came out the, be the best. So you're walking on the historic relics of the entire paving of the history while you walk through the site. And this is what we called the red band, but of course for financial reasons it's become quite small. So we had ground red asphalt, so you'd see the stone coming up, but they just, to save money, took away the grinding, so it's this disgusting red asphalt. All things like this happen when you build, we all know it. This is cartoons that we made during the competition. I really wanted to express the social uses, this parks of encounter, and cartoons are often a very good way to do it. And this is that main space where the big stone eagles are, and what I did is I said, okay, let's collect all the surveillance cameras and stuff them in the plaza. And what I wanted to do was put uh, bird's nests in all of the cameras so the birds would be singing happily, and they'd be kind of thumbing their nose at the at the Nazi eagles, which I asked to be left on the site. They asked, do you want to keep them or not? Uh, it turned out that for the birds, this was a problem because the cameras were all new. They had been replaced after 9-11, and, and they weren't very good conditions. So um, instead, I'm making a sound installation, which I'm working on just now, where loudspeakers will tell stories in a fragmented way of all the different things that have passed through the space, of all the historical layers that passed through the space. And it's, it's phenomenally exciting. And the, I'll show you in a minute the signs. There are signs in both languages, German and English. You know, only laundry, laundry delivery parking here. So very funny signs in German and English and bird's nests, which are then hung. So these posts, which originally were a means of control and power, become these sort of Christmas trees of various things. This is a model. All of the artifacts, we are painting this rusty red. That's an entire series of artifacts, the lamps, the control cabins, everything. Here it is under construction. Those are the signs. They're street names, uh, all possible things. Here they are last week putting up the signs in the different languages. And this is where the loudspeakers will be. Um, a lounge for student housing that's on the, in one of the barracks, um, taking all those funny shaped lamps and stuffing them together. Also painted red. The control cabins, which also are now red. And this checkpoint I found very fascinating because it's a quite an ugly plan, sorry, but the, the trucks came in and they all kind of drove around in these radius, the way trucks drive. 
So I took this and made a huge playground out of it. I spun out the radii to become this incredible landscape of play. And these are islands. I call them uh, worlds. So it's like the um, hiding world, the swing world, the whatever, the Welt, Spielwelt, Versteckwelt, all these different worlds that happen there. So you keep the history, but you spin it out into telling a new story. And the very last images of this site is a new layer of seating. Um, I, I get, maybe some of you ran into them in the airport of Rio de Janeiro or San Francisco, this great 1960s and 70s um, shapes. And I've always found them so fascinating. So we've made this new furniture out of it and put colored um, rubber in it so that it has a new fresh layer uh, of the site. And here they are on site. And this next project is in Hamburg. Um, I'm pleased to say that I and we were able to win a series of very, very exciting competitions. We lost this competition, but it was one of the most exciting things I've done. Uh, it's on a former island just here. That's the historic city of Hamburg right here. And for those of you who don't know, Hamburg is connected to the ocean, so it's a tidal city. The water goes up and down. And it used to be a delta. And deltas are good because they soak in their sponges. They soak in all the, when the tide goes up, and then they let out the water when the tide goes down. And that's what deltas want to do. And even if we build cities on them, the delta still wants it to go. <laughs> and the tide still goes up and down, and that water still has to go somewhere. So you see these fantastic shapes of the silt. Literally millions of tons of silt are washed in every 12 hours and washed out again. And these fantastic silt they come right into the city and they fill up all those waterways of Hamburg. Hamburg became, it is and became one of the most important harbors, international harbors of the world. So they used to, of course, build at a small scale and have small boats. But now they have huge boats, very, very deep. And all these industrial sites, they have to dredge the water channels all the time. And the more they dredge, the more the water comes up, and the more the water comes up, the more they have to raise the city. So Humber keeps lifting itself up. It's four meters above water level, the medium water level at the moment, and they're raising everything to seven because they have to get away from the flooding that's going to happen anyway. So I took this as a starting point. Oh, here's just a few images of the site looking across to Speicherstadt, a fabulous place if you haven't been. Also to the new Philharmonie from Herzog de Meuron. The bridge is on the site. The old storage buildings raised above the water level. And when the water level goes down each 12 hours, this is all slick. It's all silt. It's just this silt landscape. And people hate it. They hate the slick because you can't walk on it. You can't play in it. You can't do anything. And, and so the city is constantly building these concrete walls to get away from the slick and to, and to go up in the air, which means they're not in contact. The city is not in contact with the water that it's surrounded by. These walls are all falling apart. The competition was for this island to put new housing, densified, and the open spaces. And here's our, um, our team's contribution to the entire site. And what I decided to do on the waterfront is, instead of moving away from the water, is to create the first, as far as I know, urban delta laboratory. And this should be a place to research deltas and deltas in cities, because if you have that water level changing like that in a city, how does a city deal with that? And at the same time, to get people in touch with, I worked with a Antje Stockman, you may even know her, close colleague, uh, who said most hum people in Hamburg don't even know about the tide because it's always hidden. It's always been pushed away. So they don't know that we're actually living in a delta. And so I found this a very interesting point of departure. And I decided to make a delta laboratory. This is the waterway. And I found four typologies which I called the, um, I have to read myself, it was last year. Um, I'll try and translate spontaneously. The streaming delta, that's the, the point where the most tide comes in and out, so it's moving, uh, moving water. Then the next one is the, um, sorry, I'm missing one in here. Oh, the, the channelized delta, that's where the huge concrete walls were that I just showed you. The third one is the, um, moving delta because you, you it, the water has to turn the corner so you have these silt islands and it's become a bird, a lot of birds there. And the fourth one is the stranded delta because actually the water can't move out, it gets stuck there. So with these four typologies I tried to show the way the process 
that you live in your daily life with the process of sedimentation and of water moving and changing the shape of the edges um, of the silt of the, of the water and the floor of the water. And I ended up creating 11 places, which I won't go into detail, but there are all these different spaces along these edges which become an experience of the delta, an experience of the urban delta and what that means. Uh, and I had lots of fun. This one I called Duckfoot Park because that's in the corner where the bird refugee is. I think you can see, uh, you can just see it a little bit here. There, um, it's where the birds stand on all the poles and it's become this crazy place where all these birds are. So I made a, actually a park for them. And then the channelized uh, delta and um, different fish views. This is the streaming delta with these islands that come and go and where people could actually walk on them which would be new, that's Duckfoot Park, and this is how the delta att attaches to the new city. And that's an overview of the project. So, uh, oh yeah, now I'm gonna move on to the next project, and then we decide if I show the last two projects or if I just stop there, depending on the audience. Um, this is an expo. Every 25 years since World War II, Switzerland has made a national expo because Switzerland's not really actually one culture or one country. It's, uh, as you know, it has four national languages. It's divided by the Alps and it's very heterogeneous. So they've made three national expos to coagulate their identity. And this was an international open competition with 80 teams for the next expo in 2027 and we were able to win it, which is quite, quite exciting. It was an amazing task. And unfortunately, the far right party sunk the project. Not our project, they just said using federal funds for things like expos, silly. We should be building roads and schools and we don't need expos. So they broke with the tradition. But um, I will show it anyway because it's such an unusual task and I'll just show a few slides because it's, um, yeah, it's just crazy. So the subtitle, or I give a working title to all my projects, Public Participation at the Territorial Scale. The site was the entire, you see here the map of Switzerland, that entire region, three states of Switzerland was the site. And all the other teams chose a place. And they were mostly led by the architects and they said, we're gonna choose a place. And we said, we'll take the whole site, thanks. <laughs> we'll just make the landscape into the expo. And what you see here is the border to Germany and Austria. You see here the high Alps. So you have this incredible differentiation of landscapes. And this site has everything from traditional pagan rituals. This is the Sylvester uh, New Year's ritual where they walk through the landscape dressed as tree branches and um, with flames. It's really amazing, like old traditions. And at the same time, it's a center of high tech, the Rhine River, uh, all those things. It's all there. So we did a reading of the site in three different landscapes. We call this the lake landscape. That's the Lake of Constance. It's the biggest inland lake in Europe. This is the, um, <clears throat> we call, you can say Stadtlandschaft in Germany. It's the corridor where all the industry is, the service industry is, the highway running to St. Gallen in the east where my Museum of Natural History is, and to Zurich. And this called the mountain landscape, Berglandschaft. So Seelandschaft, Stadtlandschaft, and Berglandschaft. And alone by reading the landscape in three layers and naming them, you create a sense of understanding landscape that you wouldn't have if you just had a map. Here's the same map and you see it in section, the lake, uh, Seelandschaft, Stadtlandschaft, and Berglandschaft. And for each of those, we had a writer in our team. Um, and he gave each, uh, this is from literature, it's a common thing, but he gave each landscape a question. In the mountains, where do we come from? The archaic uh, pagan traditions, in the city, landscape band, who are we, contemporary society, and at the lake where you're looking over to Austria and Germany, where are we going, what's the future, the sense of longing of looking out at other horizons. And for each of these, we um, had a series of um, one, net, one feature that's been used since the settling by human beings. So this is the mountain landscape and they have a tradition called the dance floor, which was the only time that people ever met from the different villages. So this was our future-oriented dance floor up in the village, and each had a planning question. So the question in the mountains was the shrinking villages, everyone going to the cities, these villages are dying out, what shall we do? Um, this is the city landscape. We especially didn't do it in St. Gallen, we did it in the 
industrial, not even old industry, but like service, you know, those really crappy 70s buildings and stuff, that's where we decided to do the expo. And we made the street into a social place uh, with, I don't know, kilometer long tables to dine. And, and we, so we, it was like a sonography of all these different places and their meaning. And the reason, and I'm just gonna do the water and then I'll explain the meaning of this participation. This was at the lake, which becomes, um, um, the question was access to the lakes because they're usually private villas along the lakes and the cities are trying to get the public to be able to walk there. Uh, the main element is the pier, the oldest thing that people used to go fishing. So we made these entire crazy new designs with the pier. These were the names. Here's our, our, we have a whole series of piers and dance floors, etc. And the point I wanna get to with the participation was um, among many, many, many ideas, one of them was that you would have all these people participating in the discussion about the landscape because in Switzerland, about every day the landscape is in the newspaper. You know, shall we build, shouldn't we build, how much housing do we need? It's a big issue, but actually the landscape doesn't have a voice. And so the idea that you would, in all these existing buildings like um, bunkers underground and on boats and ships and on and haystacks, and uh, what are they called, uh, silos, silos? You would have farmers meeting artists or um, planners meeting architects and writers, and you'd have all these people coming together and meeting and discussing landscape, which never happens, in fact. And each visitor of the expo would get a personal um, map. They could put in their interest, and they'd get a personal map of the entire site saying with fictive words, um, mythologies, uh, histories, places to see, etc. And then they could go around and go to their spe specified landscape. And this is the last image. And it happened that in 2027, 300 train cars would be available, and we made it into a rolling expo. And those would be um, with video screens and saunas and libraries and all this kind of stuff, and you'd be rolling through the landscape, and then there'd be loudspeakers, which we did with this writer. Also, things you wouldn't see, for example, um, good evening, ladies and gentlemen, you're crossing from the Protestant to the Catholic region things that you had. So the whole thing was about how do we read and experience landscape, and I think it would have been a tremendous contribution to Swiss culture, but as I said, um, it was a, a stellar jury and everything, but we were not allowed to show it. So I think it's seven, and I think probably I should stop right here. I do have two more projects, but thank you for listening. Thank you so much. It's really interesting to hear. And we will, um, I know you have two other projects, but we'll also have time for some questions. If you uh, just feel free to raise your hands. I'm just going to make one little sentence just so you can imagine. Um, and I really want to hear questions. I also make housing and schools and all the normal landscape things. I've done mostly the normal things. So this lecture is not, not about what I do as a landscape architect and an urban designer, but it's about this very specific attempt to take the banality of what's being built around us most of the time today and how to suss out this poetic potential or suss out places that are able to move us. So that's what I showed you tonight. But just in case you're wondering, I'm actually a really normal <laughs> landscape architect. Yes, we all a bit envy designer. of your projects, yes. <laughs> Well, thank you, Bonnie, for these, uh, R Robin, for these really imaginative and, and conceptually rich parade of projects that you, you gave us tonight. I thought of uh, what, what took my interest, among other things, was the way that the reaction of the, the audience or the users could be ambiguous in many ways, and I was curious to see how that would happen, and I think that you are too. So, uh, a question about the, uh, the old Nazi building, for instance, where you actually collected those terrifying memories into objects, and uh, the whole site is, is, is made into a recreational field or recreational space. So how do you think people, it's not ready yet, I realize, but how do you um, expect or anticipate that people will react really when they're there, surrounded by, by horror stories, but then again on their leisure time? Uh, could, could you give a, give a comment about that 
contradiction somehow. Yes, thank you. A very good question. My interest was in making this difficult history accessible in a way that's also makes you curious and it's I don't know, you'd say appetitely, appetizing, that's a bit strange in English, but um, the terrifying part of the history is not really in the park. We're just discussing now which sounds don't come in the sound installation because the idea is, is not to bring up the terror but to bring up the military aspect. Uh, what does military do? Uh, it wasn't the NS Central, you know, that was in Berlin or whatever, but what does military do to occupy space? How does that space look? How is it used? What are the elements in it? And how can they be reused? And I tried with quite a bit of humor. I wouldn't even say I tried, but I, my projects tend to have a lot of humor in them. But that everything that was transposed, it's a lot of the American furniture. It's the paving. If no one wants to know, they can just walk on that paving. If they're interested, they can go find out. So most of the things that the checkpoint is on itself, it's not terror, terrorizing. It's just a checkpoint. But if you start to reflect about what does it mean to be in a military base that's controlling you and why is it controlling you and so on, you can go into that story of power and control. And the sound installation I just got a mail today from the mayor, cultural mayor of Heidelberg. Could we please discuss your project? He, they just caught wind of it by some other people. So of course, it always is a discussion when you're dealing with delicate things, how to do it. And I would say I tried um, overwhelmingly to do it with a sense of lightness and humor, but to instigate curiosity and reflection. That would be my response. Some other questions or comments? Yes. <laughs> that maybe some, some of us already thought about. It's, uh, it's concerning, I think, the f very first project about the geological park. Uh, this is a practitioner's uh, question, I suppose. How did you design that, really? Uh, what kind of modes did you use? Were you out on the site and conducting <laughs> the workers and the layout? Did you do anything on, on drawings or paper? Or is everything... Uh, I, it, it really looked lively and, and careful in a way that is hard to design on, on a drawing or a paper. So maybe could you comment on your way of realizing that project? Yes, also a great question. The client was the city of St. Gallen, and the project leader was an engineer who had studied architecture at a technical school, and she was excuse me, like a bulldog in a way. And she wanted everything on paper. And the project wasn't inherently the best project to do everything on paper. So in fact, everything was done on paper. Um, but I was, I had to negotiate with them that I could be on site for the um, concrete pavers, which we did all the tests. I mean, if I, I could just do a lecture on that project, I'll many of the concrete tests saying, okay, let, you know, that would be interesting, whatever. What I did for the concrete pavers was I designed nine typologies and they were in a box with styrofoam. So you could put different styrofoam in each of the boxes and then on site say, okay, and I had to literally plan it all in advance. They were gonna hammer here uh, I want the wood slats here, I want the whatever, whatever. So I had to, and, and then I'm gonna cast the dinosaur there and the shark over there and the whatever. So I had to plan all of that, which is quite, quite tricky. Um, and the trees, I, it's a, those are universes of stories. We, f the project stopped for two years because the highway authorities, the same ones I'm doing the sound barrier wall for and they're in a bunch of projects, they decided to renovate the tunnel, but they didn't want to do the boring test to see how stable the tunnel, because the tunnel's from the 1970s, until we were almost uh, pre-construction. And then they bored, and they said, you can't build a park on that tunnel. And I go, well, the city said, we've been asking you for five years. And they're like, oh, sorry, we, you know, just doing it now. So the project stopped while we negotiated what could be a park possible weights for this tunnel. And in that time, I was able to reflect about all the ways to get all these ideas nailed down so that they could be construction drawings. So that's kind of the long answer and the, the real answer. It's really all on paper. But I was on site um, quite a lot in comparison. And I, they told me I could never slow down the process, but I, I did work on site and I love to work on site. I'm, in my heart, I'm a sculptor. And it's actually my great love is being on site. and jumping around and 
working with the Chisler guy, and the Chisler guy said, I can't take this project. He was this beautiful, long haired, kind of hippie craftsman. And he said, I can't take this project. It'll keep me busy for months. And I, I just have this small workshop. And I said, Gregor, but you're such an artist. And he really was an artist. And in the end, he couldn't say no. And he was there for months on his knees. I have fabulous photos of him on his knees, chiseling all these giant quotes from the Bible. <laughs> and it was really spectacular. So in fact, yes, I was on site. But I'm sorry, my answer's so long. You're like, no, I like, stop listening. <laughs> Thank you for this uh, wonderful lecture. Uh, I was so uh, curious when you told about the playground uh, at the military plant. Uh, uh, could you tell, uh, I mean, with your other pictures, your fantasy is. Uh, going wild, how, what kind of playgrounds would you, <laughs> would you uh, design? Yes, I, everything's kind of covered up, so I, it's one of the things that I really don't, don't have pictures of yet, which makes me sad. Let's see, how does one get out of this? Oh, this was the next one, my train station angels, talking angels, telling stories, three meters high. Okay, but I won't go into that one. Um, I'm just going to scroll up there, so, oops, not that far, perfect. Um, it, that also was a tricky one for me, is how do you get children to play on a site like that? And where am I with the airport? Um, so I, coming, coming, coming. I thought that these play worlds would sort of reflect, here we are, would reflect this traffic island I even don't have a good plan, it's also very, very sad. But um, I was fascinated by these, you know, you always have these traffic islands, so to speak. And so I, I decided that would be the language, but they would somehow start to become organic, as, as if these guys are flipping out and becoming a bit crazy. So this one is called uh, Chill and Lounge. It used to be Chill and Grill, but we're, they're not allowed to grill in Heidelberg. And it's rubber. It's sort of this turquoise mixed rubber that, you know, is hilly. And it's huge. And because we've, we've had to save hundreds of thousands of, of euro on this project. So there are all these things. So it's actually not even that exciting as I wanted it to be. But the fact is it's, it's about 20 meters long or even more, 30 meters. So it's this huge rubber landscape where these teenagers can just sort of lie around, you know, half naked and drink beer and, and hang out. There's a high school just behind it. So that's the one addressing the street. The high school's over here. So the idea that you hang out here and lie around on this rubber hilly landscape and watch all your friends come by, I thought was quite fun. Then uh, this one is the um, fish deck. Fish deck is uh, hiding. And it's also many bushes, and it's using just using earth. So I tried to take materials that were coherent, other than the rubber, to coherent with this site. Earth, uh, open earth, um, raw, very raw kind of shrubs, hazelnuts and lilacs, and very um, high, uh, high book, carpine, carpinus, <laughs> what's the word? Uh, hornbeams. Uh, here I did a stage. I used... Oh, I realized. Oh, yeah, I took out some pictures, so it'll go faster. A lot of these things, including the living rooms, are the existing pavings as well of the site. So I made a stage, and uh, with it should have been a whole great staging for the people to sit on, but in the end, uh -huh, I, uh, really tragic stories from Germany about safety regulations, more strict than all the European ones, completely out of the world. But a stage surrounded by uh, hornbeams, uh, capinas, so that people could, even senior groups, uh, kids groups, whatever, could do theater, could do experiments, could do play days, could do whatever, sculpture making. So that kind of thing, and it's all raw earth or historic uh, pavings. Um, that's eight kinds of swings put in sand. So the, all these different from handicapped to giant ones and whatever. So again, it doesn't show itself very, uh, it's a playground, but it is a playground. And the only tragedy that happened, here's a, a water, like a sand, I don't know, much, uh, like sand and water. The city wanted one of those crazy sail, like a, a white, those sheets you hang with those big fat posts. And they, are, they said, we have to put it in. So that really becomes this playground look. And that's the only element that really kind of kills the place. But otherwise, that was my attempt to 
unify. I mean, there's more. There's a, a climbing and all these things. But the idea was, and then, sorry, the, the clue is the idea that you have here, I kept the asphalt and kept everything. But then the idea that a kid on a tricycle or on skating or whatever would actually, these are all paths, so they could actually be kind of curving around going on this whole site, including the historic checkpoint, and then go back into this crazy world. So the paving itself becomes a play element and connect everything. Okay. Thank you so much. I think this to be on-site landscape architects is a, it's a very good good thing. So thank you so much for today, Robin. Thanks, all of you.